Your Excellency, Deputy President of South Africa, Mr. David Mabuza, Honorable Minister of Health of South Africa, Mr. Joe Pata, Honorable Ministers of Health, President and Vice President of ICASA, friends and colleagues. It's an honor for me to address ICASA, and I'm very sorry not to be with you in person. This is a moment for us to come together and highlight the urgent need to end the inequalities that drive AIDS, COVID, and other pandemics around the world. I'm delighted that this 21st edition of ICASA is being held in South Africa, a beacon for all of us about what is possible with committed political leadership, with engaged and vibrant communities, and with a commitment to matching policies with scientific evidence. I come to ICASA with a stark warning. A new analysis we published for World AIDS Day shows that if we continue as we are, if we do not take the steps necessary to speed access and close inequalities in the HIV response, the world could face 7.7 .7 million AIDS deaths over the next 10 years, and 4.7 million of those deaths would be in Africa. Let me be clear. We do have remarkable achievements where leaders are acting boldly and together, bringing cutting-edge science, delivering services that meet all people's needs, protecting human rights, and maintaining adequate financing. AIDS-related deaths and new HIV infections are becoming rare. But rapid progress is only the case in some places and for some people. The curves are simply not bending fast enough to stop the pandemic. Last year, 890,000 Africans became newly infected with HIV, and 460,000 died from AIDS-related illnesses. Infections and deaths are following the fault lines of inequalities. Women and girls account for the majority of new infections in Sub-Saharan Africa. Six in seven new adolescent infections are among girls. This disparity is about discrimination of girls and women in society and social norms that tolerate violence and exclusion. In 2020, key populations including gay men and other men who have sex with men, sex workers, people who inject drugs, transgender people and their sexual partners accounted for 39% of new HIV infections in Sub-Saharan Africa. Progress in AIDS, which was already off track, is now under even greater strain as the COVID-19 crisis continues to rage, disrupting HIV prevention and treatment services, schooling, violence prevention programs, and more. Hard-won human rights gains are being reversed. Through 40 years of fighting the AIDS pandemic, we have learned a lot about what we need more of to end AIDS, end COVID-19, and prevent future pandemics. Four things. One, we must protect human rights and build trust in health systems. Central in our new strategy, is shifting the environment of laws and policies, rights and norms, because they are standing in the way of the impact that great science can have. We must deepen the push to eliminate the disproportionate vulnerability of our girls to HIV. Through COVID and HIV, we have seen the protective effect of education. 
we must get girls into school and keep them there through secondary education. And while there, they need comprehensive sexuality education to provide them life-saving information. Across this continent, comprehensive sexuality education is opposed by traditional and conservative forces. But we must build a movement to make it part of school curriculum everywhere. We must go counter violence against women, a terrible stain on all societies in the world and that is driving HIV on our continent. I urge us to come together to tackle it through legislation, through the courts, and through budgets. The recent AU presidential conference on positive masculinities, which I was fortunate to attend, called for an African convention on ending violence against women and girls. It is a step in the right direction. Let's rally behind President Macky Sall as he works to get the convention adopted and ratified during his term as chairperson of the African Union starting next year. We must step up our efforts to remove punitive laws against key populations. They are fueling HIV. Let us join hands to fight for dignity and science to prevail across our continent. Second, we must have sustained and adequate financing for the HIV response, for the investments in health infrastructure and systems, including our essential workers, and for social protection and education. In our region, even before COVID, public investments in health were declining, crowded out by rising debt repayments. To address the current health crisis, African countries must mobilize more domestic resources and, and increase the allocation to health. Every year, it is estimated that Sub-Saharan Africa loses between 25 and $40 billion to tax evasion. This is the money that should pay for health of our people, education of our children, social protection, and other priorities. African leadership should prioritize and demand for global tax reform to curb this tax evasion. More domestic resources can be raised through progressive taxation, including applying specific health taxes. On their part, international donors must and should contribute by providing new resources through debt relief and cancellation, more aid, special drawing rights reallocation, and, addi and additional concessional financing. Third, we need policies to ensure equal access to science. Every new technology should reach each and everyone who needs it without delay. However, currently, the newest HIV treatment and prevention drugs are too expensive for our governments to afford threatening a return to HIV treatment inequality. At this conference, I'm sure you're going to be discussing long-acting HIV technologies. Will they come first to Africa? Will they first reach those who need them most? Many of them seem on a track destined first for those who can pay more. The struggle for equal access to health technologies is one that the HIV movement has led and where so many lives that could have been saved were lost. The struggle for the best HIV tools that science can offer to be available to all people who need them in every country continues. We fight on. We've seen through the COVID emergency how scientific solutions can be fast-tracked. I hope that this will spur new breakthroughs for HIV, 
especially since the innovations achieved build on decades of HIV science. We need a cure. We need a vaccine. We need new treatment and prevention solutions. We have to have hope. Let me salute African leadership through particularly the African Center for Disease Control, African Vaccine Acquisition Task Team, African Medicines Agency, and others. Africa came together since day one to access COVID technologies for African countries collectively. Initially, it was on PPEs and diagnostics, then on vaccines, and now on continental manufacturing of vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics. Africa's collective efforts should be supported and not undermined by big pharmaceutical companies and other international actors. And this leads me to the fourth and final point. We need to find African solutions to pandemic preparedness. Community-led and community-based services and civil society accountability in particular are a key part of what has worked in AIDS and that we need more of. But it has not often been prioritized in much of the global debate over preventing future pandemics. Let's put it there. It is these vital and proven approaches that will ensure we close the inequality gaps and end AIDS. We cannot be forced to choose between ending the AIDS pandemic that is raging today and preparing for the pandemics of tomorrow. The only successful approach will achieve both. As of now, we are not on track to achieve either. We need African-led solutions and visions of pandemic preparedness. On World AIDS Day, I listened to the words of Jonathan Montoya, a young man from Mexico who lives with HIV. He called for a pandemic of courage, a pandemic of courage. That is what we need as we work to end inequalities, end AIDS, and prevent future pandemics. Thank you. Back to you, moderator.